Good afternoon, or for those joining us in Western Australia and Queensland today, good morning. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I and Mark are located, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia where you are joining us from. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to those dialing in from Victoria. Thank you for being with us today when you could be out doing things that have been off limits for some time. I'm Nikki Robinson, and today is the second webinar in our higher education series, where we will be discussing how to unlock the value of the university campus. Joining me today is Alison Kennedy, a real estate partner in our Melbourne office, Mark Mackay, a real estate pa partner in our Queensland office, John McNaught, a special counsel in our Perth office, and last but not least, Mark Frazier, who is our tax partner here in Sydney. Towards the end of today's webinar, I will be joined by Bill Parasiris from Western Sydney University, who is very well placed to share with us his insights and knowledge on how to reshape what a campus looks like to be ready for the future needs of students, universities, employees, employers and the broader community. We all know that the university sector has been impacted by more than most by the spread of COVID-19 and that the news consistently reports on the devastating impact that this is having on the sector. We appreciate you joining us today and hope you find something in today's presentation that shines a positive light on the possibilities of the future. We have left some time for questions at the end, so please send through any questions you'd like us to respond to. If we do run out of time, which is a possibility, uh, we'll try and come back to you separately. Alison Kennedy will now take us through the key themes that we'll be discussing today. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Nikki. Today we're going to talk about four key themes in unlocking the value of the campus. But before we do, it's worthwhile providing some background to our discussion. Recently, we've seen universities emerge as a new asset class in the Australian real estate market with universities across the country engaging in a number of transformative projects. Some examples include, in New South Wales, Western Sydney University, who recently completed a large-scale transformative initiative under its Western Growth banner. We'll be hearing from uh, Bill a little later in the webinar about Western Growth, but very briefly, Western Growth has already seen a number of state-of-the-art um, facilities opening at its Parramatta City campus and its Liverpool campus and it will seek to deliver more learning, teaching and research facilities in Western Sydney's CBDs and growth centres. If we go all the way over to WA, Curtin University is already embarked on the Greater Curtin Master Plan Urban Renewal Project at its Bentley campus. The first stage of the precinct has already commenced construction and will comprise a new bus interchange, a new school of design, commercial and retail spaces, perhaps uniquely for a university, a boutique hotel, student accommodation and residential apartments. Staying in WA, Edith Cowan University recently announced the move of its Mount Lawley campus into the Perth CBD under a $695 million deal uh, that has been funded by the state and federal governments. And the purpose of that is to kickstart projects in the Perth city centre. There will be 9,200 students and staff moving to the city by 2025 all on land controlled by the state government. And then if we head back over to Queensland, Griffith, Griffith University has announced a desire to position itself more strongly in the Brisbane CBD based on a major transport hub and in a manner which makes a visible statement about the university's willingness to engage with key economic, political and social players in Brisbane. So with this in mind, in this session, we are going to examine four main themes. Firstly, what we think the 21st, uni 21st century rather, university campus will look like and what factors are likely to drive development of future campuses. Secondly, we'll look at the role of universities in the development of innovation districts and some of the challenges they're faced as part of that process. We will also consider how innovation districts are helping to redefine what we envisage as the university campus of 2020 and beyond. We'll then move on to look at how a university can unlock the value in its existing land. And we'll briefly discuss the development structures that universities can utilise to best achieve this. And then we couldn't finish today without discussing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and 
uh, what that might mean for universities in the short and the long term with respect to land development. So if we move on to the next slide, we're going to further set the scene for our discussion today. And I'm going to share with you some statistics about the university sector as it currently is in Australia. So the latest 2020 data snapshot from Universities of Australia reveals the following. A university is educated around 1.56 million students in 2018, and they directly employed around 130,000 staff. In terms of numbers, Australia has 37 public universities and four private universities. And it's interesting to, to know that there are over 450,000 international students that studied at universities in 2018. And that is Australia's fourth largest export behind iron ore, coal and natural gas, with a staggering value of around $40 billion every year. Universities Australia also showed us that universities are having to diversify their sources of income, with the Australian government contributing only around 50% 56% of uh, universities' revenue. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic will affect these numbers, at least in the short term. But there is no reason to believe that these strong numbers won't return post-pandemic. We also know that the modern educational and economic environment is requiring that universities be run as big businesses. The executive teams at universities have become an extremely important driver of necessary change in strategy. And we are also seeing an increasing interest from overseas universities in the Australian market, given the growth that the market has seen in the last two decades and the significant number of overseas students who are travelling to study at Australian universities. So what do universities generally look like now and campuses now? They have changed a lot since I went to university but uh, I think there is a long way to go still. So the traditional university model involved a main campus with numerous uh, satellite campuses, which are often faculty specific. And many universities also have city and regional campuses. While some campuses are located close to social transport and housing infrastructure, that's not always the case. And where there's a lack of social and transport infrastructure, there's often a lack of connectivity that can have a significant impact on student numbers around the campus. Some of our universities are located near or within industry precincts. And examples of this are Macquarie University, which is located in the heart of Australia's largest tech precinct, and University of Technology Sydney, which is located in inner Sydney's digital and creative precinct. In industry precincts and innovation precincts aren't the norm in Australia, but they're certainly becoming. Some of our universities have pressing accessibility and capacity issues. We know that Sydney University, for example, currently has less than a 1% vacancy at its Camperdown campus. But by contrast, other universities have an abundance of land. And where this occurs, the surplus land is often not located close by good social transport and housing infrastructure. So to kick off with our first issue for consideration, let me hand you back to Nikki to discuss what the 21st century university looks like. Thanks, Alison. Um, and I should declare that as mainly property lawyers presenting today, we have a tendency to see everything as a real estate play. Um, and we are not educators, and we know that we will never know more about how campuses work than you do. But when looking at a campus as a real estate play, what we've come to realise that every university's issues are different. Some have too much land in the wrong place. Some have not enough land in the right place. Um, and as a result, each university will need to develop a strategic plan that addresses its particular needs. And so hopefully today we will have something for everyone in addressing those needs. So how do you future proof your university campus and how can you use commercial opportunities available at its campus and through its land holdings? to expand and develop its core business of education, teaching and research. This year has taught us all that we cannot predict a future. But prior to the disruption caused by COVID-19, as Alison outlined, we did see a movement strongly toward the university being developed as part of a broader innovation precinct. 
So I thought it might be helpful to run through what the characteristics of some of those precincts are. They provide greater, greater connectivity and accessibility between the campus and other commercial activities, retail activities and employment opportunities. They have good accessibility to existing transport and provide for new future transport links into the precinct. They allow for student and low cost residential accommodation and they allow for the ability, the ability for universities to drive their own development and expansion with sufficient flexibility to change to the emerging needs of the university. And now more than ever, that's going to be critical for universities to have as we see things scale back or scale up depending on the students who can come to the university um, and the future needs of that campus. We see vertical campuses and state-of-the-art technology and labor laboratories being developed within the campus in a way that we never have before, rather than large communal spaces or lecture theatres being developed. And we see connections to industry and other participants who are going to use the services of the students and the universities. It's the in and this is really important, and I'll talk about it on the next slide, in terms of creating an environment where students, startups, scale-ups and larger industry can, can come together and develop solutions that can go all the way through someone's lifetime. We're also seeing an integration between different levels of education. So we're seeing high schools um, co-locate with universities, so that connectivity starts even earlier in the process. And we're seeing the ability for universities to pool their resources, including with other universities, to create a better offering for students. So instead of universities competing for students, they're working together to create a better offering for the students of the future. Given the current geographic restrictions we've had on movement, there has been a shift, and we've sort of all experienced that shift back to the local rather than centralised space, such as in, in sort of the Sydney CBD or in each of the cities. The university as part of a precinct in a local geographic area makes perfect sense. And on the next slide, we'll look at some of the key, the three key assets that really converge to make those precincts work. And, and I'll use the term districts and precincts when I talk about innovation districts. Uh, they're pretty interchangeable and mean the same thing. Um, what an innovation precinct does is it represents an intentional effort to create a new space to support the convergence of, of sectors and ideas. And it's about bringing together institutions, entrepreneurs, startups, scale-ups and industry participants to develop this relationship amongst those people for a, sing for a singular purpose, but at different stages of that purpose. There are three key, dri key drivers of the successful innovation district, and they're all up there. They're the economic assets, and these are often underpinned by the university as one of the key economic assets. Also, we often see um, hospitals put in that space, and the hospital university co-locating can also be an incredibly strong pull to the creation of an innovation district. Um, we see in that sector cultivators, and that's where we see companies coming in to want to be close to where research and development and students are working to harness new ideas as soon as they possibly get, can and provide the impetus and the, and the funding in some case for those ideas to be developed. Um, then we have the physical assets, and again, the university falls into this category. And these are what knit the district together, and it generally is defined by a, bit, a relatively small geographic area with everything there that you need to live, work, play, learn um, in, in the one space. And ultimately, what these do is create a networking asset, the, the ability to bring people together physically in a space to generate more ideas. Um, and because the university sits with all, within all three of these categories, they're ideally placed to sort of be the core of an innovation district. Um, many of you will already be part of some of these districts. Um, some examples in Australia are sort of the Westmead Innovation District, the en Engineering Innovation Hub, and some of the examples that Alison spoke of earlier, um, the Greater Curtin Master Plan. Um, and it's a big shift, and I often go to the City of Seattle when we're talking about this with clients, um, Microsoft started in Seattle and they basically developed their own campus of an enormous scale in Redmond. Um, and it was just Microsoft. 
and that was about 30 years ago. And if you fast forward and look at what the Amazon campus has done now at Lake Union in Seattle, they've integrated right next to the University of Washington and they've got space for startups and scale up. So they're really harnessing ideas and creating a space for people to come together and use those ideas to develop, develop a whole range of products. Um, Mark Mackay is now going to run us through some of these structured examples that can be used um, both in an innovation district space, but also just on an um, individual campus space. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, let's turn to some strategies to unlock university land. Whilst it's obviously important that universities continue to develop their existing university-only campus facilities, including by effecting upgrades and refurbishments as required, Today, we would like to turn to a few real estate structuring options which the university may seek to use to unlock university land or to repurpose university land. For example, take on new ventures to tap into new markets or to partner with industry. A few examples, mixed use developments on campus where part of the works developed will be used for university purposes and other parts for commercial uses to create an alternative revenue source for the university. Take another example, commercial, retail or residential uses on campus, where university land is developed for other uses for the purpose of generating an alternative revenue source for the university. In government language, monetising but not selling land. Take another example, developments either on or off campus. For example, either act as drivers for university innovation or a partnership with industry or potentially both. The university may wish to retain 100% ownership of its land or to unlock capital or drive investment through a part ownership model or possibly the university may be happy to lease land either in the interest of preserving its capital for other purposes or making a commitment only for a fixed period. It may, of course, be simpler than all of that. It may be that university simply sells land that it owns, particularly if it is freehold and in the interest of monetising that and allocating capital elsewhere. Certainly, universities have, in appropriate circumstances, done this before in relation to both non-core and investment-style real property assets. Turning to the next slide, I just want to run through with you some possible land tenure options that you might consider as you move through this desire to unlock university land. What structure would best suit a particular outcome or a particular set of circumstances will depend on many things, some of those being who owns the land? For example, is it the university itself? Is it the Crown? Is it vested land? And is the land subject to any trust? What level of control does the university wish to have over the future use of the land? What is the university's appetite for risk? What is the, is the university willing to take on development risk in the interests of securing a better revenue outcome? What are the relevant tax drivers in relation to the development? For example, will development in partnership with a commercial developer jeopardise the university's existing tax concessions? More on that from Mark Fraser shortly. What are the university's objectives? And if partnering with industry, what are the industry partners' objectives? Let's turn a little bit to design of land tenure and, and you'll hear me talk a little bit about design because in my mind, when you're talking about a particular set of facts, it's the design of the land tenure that might well um, enhance the outcome for the university. So working through some of the possible options, direct ownership structures, possibly an unincorporated joint venture with a well-heeled commercial partner. Direct ownership will most likely be necessary or preferred where large amounts of capital are involved. A co-ownership agreement will likely form part of any unincorporated joint venture between the university and its commercial partner. Possibly a leasehold structure, whether that be a ground lease or a conventional lease of land and buildings, particularly relevant if there is to be repurposed buildings involved. Take, for example, when the building may be surplus to current university need and or a trial of this sort to be initiated, possibly preliminary to a more permanent partnering option with that particular party. Land swap agreements, particularly useful to unlock capital without affecting a net loss of land or opportunity to university. 
co-location opportunities, possibly on greenfield sites, where there is a mix of university and industry capital involved with the design of the tender te tenure to take account of the conditions on which the various parties' capital is made available and also the way in which the assets will be used. Now over to Sean in Perth to discuss some further issues to consider when universities are looking to dispose or redevelop land assets. Thanks, Mark. So I'm going to talk about a few high-level legal considerations for universities when they decide to pursue a redevelopment or some sort of a real estate project. And two immediate questions usually arise when a university asks us for legal advice. The first one is, does the university have the power to pursue the project? And the second key one is, is the project consistent with the university's purposes or its charter? And these questions aren't just important for the university itself, they're also important for the third party who's looking to engage with the university and project financiers who want to know that they've got security of tenure. We often find the third parties will be anxious to know that the state can't come in and exercise control over parts of the university's land and thereby jeopardise the project. Um, so when we look at whether the university has the power to pursue the project, our first step is often to look at the enabling legislation that governs the university and also other legislation that relates to the real estate. It can be very clear in some instances that the university has the power to pursue the project. So you might be granting a lease of a laboratory uh, for educational purposes. But it can be much less clear for some of these larger projects that you're hearing about today where you've got a long-term project with a lot of different interrelated works and parts of the project are being pursued by um, partners of the university, be they private or other government authorities. When we look at the purpose of the project, we often need to focus on whether there's an educational purpose associated with it, because that will often be underpinning the university's power to pursue certain commercial projects. Again, <clears throat> it can be obvious for more simple projects, but for larger ones, it can be more difficult to figure out how this will apply. The university also has to look at how revenue from the project needs to be treated and whether it has to be invested or used by the university in a certain way. So we're often involved in advising on these early stage, um, these early stage considerations. Assuming that you've got the power to pursue the project and it's consistent with the purposes of the university, you also need to factor in that there might be additional statutory consents that are needed. For example, you may have a project that's long term or it's over a certain value threshold. And as a result of that, you need to get additional consents from government authorities or ministers. Um, in some cases, those consents need to be obtained early in the process or before documentation is entered into. In other cases, you can make your documentation conditional upon those consents being obtained. Occasionally, we see instances where uh, you will have a third party occupying university land and the formal approvals haven't been put in place yet, and we often need to advise on this, this issue as it comes up. Finally, each university, and some of you will be aware of this, will have its own internal governance, procurement and consent policies. And some of those policies can take quite a bit of time to implement, and they're not always consistent with the timeframes that other authorities or the private sector try to impose on a university as part of a project. So this requires a detailed consideration of the university's consent procedures by the deal team early on in the process and to put some time in to understand how, how that will factor into the overall project. So there's just a few things to be aware of at a high level. I'll now talk about a few of the commercial projects that we're continuing to see nationally across campuses on the next slide. <coughs> so, You've already heard about a few of the projects around the Australia and um, innovation precincts. Another thing we're seeing is significant retail offerings across campuses. Gone are the days when the university cafeteria was the only place to eat your lunch. We're now getting significant retail food offerings, and those offerings are often uh, made consistent with the timing of the academic year and timing when students will be on campus. We're also seeing uh, larger format grocery stores being made available on campus, where you're attracting people, not just students and staff, but the greater community onto the campus for those retail offerings. <clears throat> As 
part of this, universities need to spend a bit more time thinking about how rental and payment structures are being treated, especially when they're tied into the retail turnover. Another thing that we see pop up on some of these projects is where a university inadvertently creates a shopping centre on its campus by virtue of having a large number of retail stores in a certain area or uh, within a certain building. And this can indirectly impose extra requirements on a university and how it manages that area. The final thing that we're seeing with retail at the moment is the, the COVID-19 effect. Uh, obviously, this is having a huge effect on foreign students and retail turnover. So campuses nationally are needing to engage with their retailers um, in the current term and then as the emergency period for COVID-19 continues into next year. The next point on the slide is industry participation. So as Nikki alluded to earlier, we're continuing to see businesses lease and develop land or areas of university land uh, in conjunction with research and development that's been undertaken with the university. The benefit of this is that it allows the university to use more of its campus for more of the year, not just the academic year, and it also gives students access to businesses and vice versa. The next one is accommodation. Um, and there's a few limits to this. We're starting to see hotel and short-term accommodation options being offered up by universities or being pursued. And this takes into account that a lot of campuses nationally are actually in enviable positions and they're close to transport nodes. So it makes sense that if they can deliver these accommodation options, um, they should do well. The next one is student accommodation, which is at the forefront of all of the campuses thinking nationally. Again, sometimes we see this being undertaken on land that's controlled by the university or owned. In other cases, we see it on private land or adjacent land and a private developer is delivering the building itself. Sometimes you'll see universities work together and underwrite a certain amount of student beds in order to make that student accommodation project commercially viable. Another thing that we see is retirement villages and aged care. Now this is an unusual one and we don't see as often, um, but a university can make some land available for the aged care sector and then in conjunction may appoint a retirement village operator or aged care operator to manage that site for them. Um, this can be a difficult project to pursue and the university has to think about the term of the project and the legal restrictions around running those kinds of aged care operations. The final, the final thing on the list is cultural offerings. So we are also seeing universities beginning to offer some sort of cultural offering or artistic offering as part of their redevelopment. Uh, an example of this is uh, Edith Cowan in Western Australia has recently announced that it's going to move into the Perth CBD. Part of this will be the Performing Arts School and they've committed to delivering a certain amount of public performances during the academic year. I think this is an example of universities looking for other ways of generating revenue and to engage with the broader community, not just their students and foreign students. So I'll now hand over to Mark to talk about some of the tax considerations for universities. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Sean. Um, so a university enjoys uh, its tax benefits because it's a charity. Um, and it's a charity on the basis that its objective is the advancement of education. And this will be determined by reference to enabling legislation, um, looking at the, at the charter of the university. Um, clearly, there's a number of transactions that may arise in terms of the sorts of developments we're looking at, which could give rise to a, a taxing point. So, for example, the transfer of property, um, there might be a joint development, <coughs> a joint venture where the um, university earns income in some form. Um, these are sort of otherwise taxable transactions. So it's obviously important that the, the tax exemption exists to protect the university from tax with respect to the transactions occurring within the development. Um, but there's really a much bigger issue at stake here, and that is to ensure that the development itself uh, doesn't undermine the university's exemption um, as, as a whole, so that the university um, retains tax benefits associated with its charitable status. And it's important we don't sort of blow those up. Um, so this can be reflected in income tax exemption, um, the university status as a deductible gift recipient, 
um, so that people, people can make deductible gifts to the university. Um, GST exemption, there's some stamp duty issues, um, and importantly, a land tax exemption. So um, we've got to be very careful that the development itself doesn't blow up our entitlement to these, um, to these benefits and exemptions. It is clear, however, now that a charity can pursue uh, commercial activities um, without necessarily jeopardising its charitable status. It was open to some doubt the extent to which it could do this. There was a High Court decision in 2008. Um, it's a big decision in the, in the charities area called Word Investments. As a result of that decision, um, that clarified that it's, it's okay to carry on commercial activities, um, provided that they're in furtherance of the charitable objectives of the, of the organisation, in this case of the university. Um, so you can carry on commercial undertakings, but the commercial undertaking can't be an end in itself. Um, the test here is really whether the income generated from the commercial activity is directed to the university to use in the advancement of its um, educational objectives. So um, just by way of a really simple example, um, where you've got a redevelopment involving the university um, entering into a joint venture. Um, and what I'm about to say is, is, are points which have arisen out of um, previous approaches to the ACNC and the tax office. It's, it's clear that the structure of that joint venture, for example, um, how the boxes and the lines lie up on the structure diagram, um, for example, whether it's incorporated, whether it's unincorporated, whether you've got lease income, doesn't really matter. Um, what's important from the perspective, particularly of the ACNC, is that all revenue which is, is, is distributed uh, to the university through the JV in this example will go to um, and will be applied to the university's charitable purpose advancing education. It will be important that the university's share of the revenue generated is commensurate with its equity contribution to the project. Um, any private benefits from the project. In other words, where you've got a third party development, a developer, joint venture partner, contractors, um, uh, employees of the JV, it's important that um, any transactions with those uh, parties are properly characterised as being incidental to the charitable purpose of the university. So what, what does that mean? Um, it means that you can't um, pay over non-arms length, over market rates, for example, to contractors. Um, you need to align, if you like, the arrangements to a, a kind of an arms length paradigm. So um, in broad terms, it's important to ensure in any of these transactions that there's no distortion of, of, of arms length dealings. Um, another point, perhaps the university might want to participate through a, through a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary, might manage the project or for liability reasons. Um, again, that's acceptable, provided the subsidiary has the overarching pur purpose that is charitable, or advancing education, and clearly you'd want to put that um, in the subsidiary's constitution. Again, any profits distributed by the subsidiary um, should, be, um, should go to the university for the furtherance of the university's charitable purpose. And again, any incidental benefits to third party contractors and so forth um, should be um, properly characterised as, as incidental to the main purpose. So in the past, um, whilst we've been fairly confident that the developments kind of fall within these parameters that we've looked at, um, we have sought um, non-binding advice from the ACNC and we've sought um, tax rulings from the ATO and we've, seen, we've sought um, advanced rulings from the Office of State Revenue in relation to land tax. Um, now, Unfortunately, the ACNC, which is a resource con constraints, are now not prepared to give us advance rulings. But um, you know, it should be possible to get comfort from the ATO and um, from the OSR if necessary, notwithstanding that. And I think the, the only point I'd raise here is, even where you're very confident um, that, as I say, that the, the development is is in accordance with um, with objectives um, and so forth. Um, I think it is important to get those sign-offs simply by virtue of the fact that the risks are so big 
um, it's just worth going that little extra bit to um, to ensure you've got confidence. Nikki. Thanks, Mark. Um, the next slide, I'm just going to very briefly touch in a little bit more detail on some of the structuring options that um, Mark and Queensland ran us through earlier. Um, and these options are really where you're looking at a wholesale redevelopment, either on land that you currently own at, the at a university campus or land you're going to acquire for the purposes of developing a new campus. Um, and there are four main structures that we tend to use and, and there are a multitude of variations to these structures. Um, but as I said, I'm just going to touch, them, touch on them at a high level. The first one is where you own the land as a university and you are comfortable in taking on the development risk as, as a means to then being entitled to full control of whatever is developed on your site and being able to bring in other partners if and when you need them or providing space to startups or scale-ups. Um, there, there is some opportunity in this structure to defray some of the risk under your DNC contracts, but you know you get full risk and full reward in this structure and you, and you really just procure the development for your own benefit. The second structure we see which can be used to sort of defray some of those risks is a joint venture, joint venture structure. And this is where we're talking about a joint venture in terms of land ownership. So you might sell 50% of the freehold land that you own or acquire with a developer on a 50-50 basis. Um, and this would suit a mixed use development um, where part of the intended works are for university purposes and part might be for completely different purposes such as commercial or residential. Um, it could also suit an entirely commercial project that you're undertaking to you know, generate funds for university purposes. Um, all of these structures really are sort of a, a longer term proposition. And, and the thing I would say about the, the bottom three are that one of the main criteria that we talk to the universities when we're advising them is who, who you want to partner with. So I think Sean mentioned it as well, making sure that you have alignment in what your seeking to do on a site if you're going to go into an ownership structure or a long-term leasehold structure is absolutely critical that, that, that the stakeholders that are all going to be involved um, have an alignment about the desired outcomes and how long people are going to be there and that there's flexibility in whichever structure you choose that will um, allow you to pull certain levers if you, if you need to exit early. There's clarity about what that looks like from everybody because from my perspective as a legal advisor, that is where some of the most difficult conversations come up in terms of structuring once you've sorted out tax and make sure that the tax structuring all works. Um, so that joint, the joint venture structure there um, is really where you, it's a 50-50 and you share in the, the risks and rewards on that basis. Um, there is some loss of control for the university, but there's also some capital contribution from the developer. Um, the leasehold structure we refer to in the third um, arrow is really where the university is quite happy to lose control, sort of operating control of the land, but they can't or won't or don't want to sell it. So sometimes universities can't sell the land without ministerial consent and may not want to do that. Um, sometimes the board may make a decision that they can lose it for a period of time, but want it to sort of come back to the university ultimately. Um, this structure allows the developer to take the development risk and the university, if, if that's part of the desire, can come back in as a tenant once a building's developed. Um, and we've seen this structure used quite successfully um, where that's one of the sort of the aims is to have someone else come in and take development risk and then they'll pay a market rent to take back some of that site to use as a campus. Um, the advantages there at the university will usually be paid some sort of upfront premium for the grant of a long-term lease prior to development taking place um, and they can then get a rental stream through the term of that lease. Um, and as Mark Mackay um, mentioned, this is also a structure that can be monetized. Um, the unincorporated joint venture, which is also something we've advised on, um, the university remains 100% owned, but the university and the developer then both enter into sort of a structure where they have companies that hold um, its tenants in common, a leasehold interest down from that ground lease structure. Um, that can be used quite successfully if more than one building is being developed. So the university might have a campus developed that it's going to solely occupy and then there's a commercial premises that's available to the developer to generate income from. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a really high level sort of brush across some of the, the structures that we use when there's a really long term project in play, different to what Mark was talking about where there are some um, shorter term, more flexible arrangements that can be used. Um, now Alison is going to take us through some other solutions. 
Thanks, Nikki. So what have COVID-19 impacts and other solutions that may be born out of a response to the pandemic or otherwise? And as Nikki said uh, at the start of the presentation, whilst we don't presume to know um, the extent of the COVID pandemic on your businesses, we assume that the pandemic will result in a number of impacts, at least in the short to medium term. And the obvious impacts are a decrease in international student numbers, a greater move to digital learning platforms, resulting in a decreased physical presence at the traditional campus, an increase in student accommodation vacancy rates, uh, decreases in revenues, uh, both from a decrease in those international student um, enrolments, but also from traditional sources of on-site commercialisation uh, in light of decreased foot traffic and the resulting cash, pre uh, cash flow pressures that uh, come from all of those decreases. Now that doesn't bode well for the university sector. However, however as Benjamin Franklin said, out of adversity, comes opportunity and we are starting to see a shift from our university clients towards embracing new ways of unlocking value in their land portfolios to tackle these constraints. We expect that the, the COVID-19 pandemic will see the use of alternative options increase um, and particular, particularly those which allow universities to partner with industry and property developers and investors in a way which is less reliant on cash. In addition to the options that we've already discussed to unlock the value in university land, or even to better position university offerings close to transport infrastructure and innovation hubs, some other solutions that universities can consider are mentioned on the slide. So Mark has already discussed land swap arrangements. So where there's an exchange of low priority university land holdings with land of a similar value in a more accessible location um, and where there are land swap opportunities that can obviously assist in allevi alleviating cash flow pressures. We're also seeing more and more adaptive reuse of land. So this is tackling the problem of a lack of land in highly populated areas which are close to those transport and infrastructure hubs by adapting existing buildings in those locations for university purposes. And some examples include uh, repurposing existing office buildings. And we're seeing that, for example, in the Melbourne CBD where Monash College is doing a, um, a, a refurbishment of a uh, close to 400,000 square metre office building for a new consolidated vertical campus. And we also see the opportunity for universities to take advantage of a significant amount of uh, sublease space that is currently coming to market as a result of the pandemic. So that, that potentially gives universities the opportunity to increase their offerings in some of those highly sought after CBD locations. But universities often also have the ability to make the use, make good use of government opportunities and to take advantage of funding and infrastructure projects to boost those opportunities. I mentioned at the outset Curtin University in WA, but some other examples include Victoria University in Melbourne, which is benefiting from the location of the new Footscray Hospital that is being constructed by the Victorian State Government on land which is currently owned by the university uh, to create a world-class health and education precinct. Murdoch University in Perth has also recently benefited from government funding um, to build a new vertical campus in the Perth CBD. And should the proposed Melbourne suburban rail loop ever be constructed, there will be a significant benefit to Monash University um, from the increased transport connectivity that will result uh, in the univer new university train station. So I'll now hand back to Mark, who will talk about what solution is best. In terms of which solution is best, it might be tried, but it depends. So on screen, you'll see a shopping list of issues that you would take into account, most of which we've touched on today. If there's one message that I'd like to leave you with is that the structure matters. In terms of the now, the midterm, the long term of the success of your new projects to unlock university land, the structure you adopt needs to serve the university and needs to enhance the university continuing to take on new challenges and new things. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that it works the best. In my experience, deal dealers 
understand exactly what they want to achieve in the first one, two and three years. And what lawyers do is they consider what happens in five years, what happens in 10, even if it's intended to be a much longer project. We think about flexibility, we think about the options, we think about the disasters. And in doing that, we set the university up for success in pursuing its uh, the new world order. Some of you are on different journeys on this, but in terms of the journey, the structure matters. Over to you, Nikki, to talk about Western growth. Because we are going to run out of time if I don't. Western Growth is a large-scale transformative project that was led by Western Sydney. It was established in 2016, but I think as we'll hear from Bill, it, it began long before that. Um, and the intention was to meet sort of the main four criteria. It was to revitalise the Western Sydney University campus network between the urban and CBD locations, to create new technologically abled learning spaces for teaching and research, repurposing some of its existing assets to generate a capital fund and incorporating its learning, teaching and research into real world environment. And this was both by partnering with industry, but also creating living lab laboratory opportunities. So if I fast forward and look at what's been achieved by Western Growth in 2020, it has increased staff and student accessibility to its campuses. It's enhanced student experience through the access to technology rich learning environments. It's boosted the economic environment of Western Sydney through its investments. It's improved the use and the return of the property assets for the university. It's created new commercial revenue streams and it's opened up access to alternative finance sources through partnerships to minimise the risk exposure of the university in its developments. Now I'm going to just put up some of the projects that form part of Western um, growth and ask Bill Parasiris to join me and we're going to do a quick switch of seats. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see shortly. Here we go. Um, hi, Bill. Hi, Nikki. Thank you. Um, here are some of the examples of what's been developed under the Western Growth Banner. Um, and we might just go back one slide, if we could. Thanks. Um, and I'd be remiss in not acknowledging the huge contribution made to these projects by the various partners that WSU has teamed up with on the delivery of them. And these include Charter Hall on a number of the projects in Parramatta and one at Westmead, um, Mervac, who's involved in the Milpera campus redevelopment. Um, there's a Lancom one that I have left off the slide. I apologise to Lancom. And Walker Corporation, who are currently working with um, the university on, on the Parramatta North Campus and the MacArthur Medical Research Centre. So, as I noted earlier, choosing the right development partner is one of the most important decisions in the process, and especially when you, when you think about all the things that you, no one thinks about at the time they're doing the documentation. So now I'll do a proper introduction to Bill. So joining me today is Bill Parasiris. Bill is the Executive Director of Real Estate and the Commercial Division of Finance and Resources at Western Sydney University. Um, and I've worked with Bill over the last five years on Western Growth and a number of the projects that sit within the portfolio. So mm -hmm. I thought there's nothing better than having a practical discussion around what all of this means when you look at it together for universities in a year that's been really tough on universities. Definitely. Um, so going back to 2016, and I know from our discussions it started much earlier than that for you, what what did you envisage that the campus would look like and what was the impetus to wanting to establish something like Western Growth when you looked forward and thought, what are we doing here? I think, Nikki, that's a really good question to ask. Um, it, it's quite difficult to answer in, in a simplistic sort of way uh, because there wasn't an impetus uh, in 2016 that sort of led to us thinking about Western Growth. If we look at Western Growth, um, it really commenced as early as 2007. But for, further back, it, it was part of um, uh, discussions back in the 80s that established the university um, in that the university would use its land holdings um, to, to help make it financially secure. Um, in 16 was where we started thinking about how, how can we look at a, a, a more informed long-term program of works that will help establish financial security or a corpus to help return uh, revenue streams, alternative re revenue streams for the university to help invest back into teaching, learning and research. Um, you know, when we look at that, um, it, it really put together, we started off with putting together a piece of work. We, we had multiple attempts. 
um, to get Western Growth approved by the board. Um, and there was five projects that were attached to that. But the success of the previous projects being, you know, the work we did with Lancome on MacArthur Heights, um, what we had informed, um, the university had informed at Westmead um, in stages one and two, the residential sale of, of the two lot subdivision we created there to, to help inform IQ. It was used to help um, give the university a level of comfort. One PSQ had commenced and, and, and it was working um, and it achieved all the strategic intent. I'm just um, going to cut you off. So for those who are not... Um, um, based in Sydney or Western Sorry. Sydney, one PSQ is the first high-rise campus that was delivered um, with Charter Hall at, at Parramatta Square. That's correct. So, so the success of that, but also the missed opportunities that the university uh, had seen out of its lessons learned, um, is what really sort of accelerated the thinking of putting together an advanced business case um, to the Board of Trustees to support the establishment of Western Growth as an official program for that purpose. Okay. Yeah. And when and as part of that process, did you look further than sort of what you were doing in, in Sydney? Did you look overseas at different projects? Like how did how did you inform what that final structure looked like? Um, we did. We did. Um, we looked at our at our colleagues because I, I, I can't profess to say that this is um, something unique to Western Sydney University. Um, you know, Macquarie, um, uh, Melbourne, UTS, um, uh, Sydney, other universities have done this, but uh, University of Canberra. But we looked at those, but we looked um, internationally. You know, um, Pennsylvania University was one of the things we really looked at, you know, back in the, I think it was in the 40s, 50s and 60s, they started acquiring land for that purpose, which now is, is coming to realisation. Um, we looked at that. We looked at Docklands in, in, in England and um, um, we looked at the, uh, the park, uh, the Olympic Park in England and the success of that and how that started to develop precincts and looked at a precincts approach. Um, again, the lessons learned, the missed opportunities out of um, Parramatta Square, uh, one PSQ, the Peter Shergold building, um, how a precinct approach um, has more value than just looking at a standalone facility. So it, it helped inform Western growth more broadly uh, and the success and the importance of precincts and innovation precincts uh, and collaboration within the precinct. Yeah. I think that's a, that's the really important part, creating yeah. that space to collaborate. Correct. Um, and, and to the extent that you can, was there anything that happened or any particular challenges that you learned along the way? And, and probably the Peter Shergold building is one of those where you, you said you missed some of those precinct opportunities. That that really was the aha moment that made you go, you know what, we need to do this differently because there's something that we could have done or we can, you know, we've benefited from. Um. There wasn't one particular moment that I could I could identify that, that did that. I think when we looked at it, uh, and I've spoken to some of the colleagues that are online at the moment, the biggest um, thing that we've done is, is look at the lessons learned, what we got wrong. Uh, we looked at the multiple, and there was multiple issues, we, uh, points that we got it wrong with, with the Peter Shergold building. We pulled that together and said, I, uh, that missed opportunities, um, and, and said that the biggest thing is having a long-term view of, of what's being done and having a strategic long-term view, not what's been successful, what was Wrong and how you correct it, um, and also what's the way of the future? How do you diversify, and and how do you do risk um, and, and able to grow and contract as required market dependent? Yeah, well that that yeah. was that was good foresight given yeah. where we are now. Now I know you to be a very practical and commercial person in your approach to life, um, and I'm very legal in my approach. Um, how does that play out in a university space? And, and this is probably for all the people who sit within the property teams at universities, mm -hmm. where universities are known for their theoretical approach and their theoretical understanding of something. Like, was that, did that make it more interesting? Did it make it more challenging? Um, I think the initial approach is that they're um, competing priorities. Yeah. Um, I, I think getting over the hurdle that they're actually competing priorities is, is, is the first step. Uh, and that's again done by ongoing collaboration and consultation with the relevant stakeholders that, you know, the commercial imperatives and priorities benefit the academic um, priorities and benefit, um, and, and, and the diversification of revenue streams help to deliver on that. Um, and also looking at the positives, you know, how do you bring in some of that thinking, the research to inform what you're doing in the future. You know, I, I don't profess to be a property expert, but, but uh, you know, working with our partners, seeing that, you know, whether it's a residential development or commercial development, we're really being informed by projects that were successful. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about it, those projects uh, were being thought about five, 10, sometimes 15 years ago, and we're using that knowledge to develop what we're putting in place today, working with the academics to think about, okay, what's different, what can we do, what's it going to look like in the future, can help inform the project and help uh, 
make it more viable uh, to a certain extent. Um, just a specific example, social affordable housing is, is one of the things that we're strongly looking at at the moment, given that we've got nearly um, 25 to 30 individual um, residential um, sites or units that are within the pipeline of Western growth. We, we, we have a strong commitment to that. And you know, how do we inform it into the future, not as it's seen today? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that will be changing quickly, given the year that yeah. we've just had. But I, and I have spent this year finding the silver linings from COVID. So, mm. and, and sometimes that seems uh, um, a little bit difficult, but actually sometimes it's easier than you think if you recast it. So I, I imagine, given the, um, the, the varied revenue streams that have been developed through Western growth, that that mm. is a silver lining for this year. So it can actually demonstrate to the, to the academics who, who may struggle with change or the way that things are delivered to see that actually that foresight four or five years ago mm -hmm. is, is paying dividends today. Definitely is, uh, but also the flexibility in the, in the fixed, um, in, in your, your OPEX fixed costs. Um, we were able to, to switch um, um, and switch facilities off because yeah. of the vertical campuses, but we were also able to quickly deliver learning online without yeah. any, um, you know, without any significant downtime because we had put the technology in place in those vertical campuses to enable that. Uh, looking at how we moved into the future and, and uh, significantly looking at the potential social distancing requirements, the vertical campuses enabled that far easier, far easier than our, than our lecture theatres or our flat floor teaching spaces on the traditional campuses. So it's allowed that. Uh, it has created problems with the commercial revenue streams also being impacted, you know, um, but, but we've worked through it and um, uh, we've done that. But the, the, the financial security that was put in place pre-COVID uh, helped, helped to offset the cost today. Um, the savings and the efficiencies in that vertical campus being 20 to 30% um, more efficient per EFSA or per students in delivering teaching and learning yeah. assisted with that and and um, we were in a unique position to be able to do that. The other thing Western Growth did is, you know, some of our long-term projects, um, there were opportunities, you know, given that there is a lot, of, a lot of capital in the market, we're able to bring forward some of that capital and 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 uh, to fund throughs or, or transactions yeah. during COVID that created significant liquidity to the university yeah. to help us see through this year and next year, which are the biggest um, um, at the moment impacted years financially. And that, and that's interesting and, and I think that goes back to who you partner with. Mm -hmm. So who you choose you're going to partner with and, and the flexibility and a structure to be able to do something like that where something unforeseen happens. Um, I think we've covered off some of my other questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I, and I always like this question sort of from a, when I talk to developers. So I'm going to ask you, did you have a favourite? Oh, I think that's dangerous. Oh, that's too dangerous. Um, that's yeah, too no, dangerous. I think they're like asking which is your favourite child. I, I don't, but, 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 I, look. Or is there a structure that you think works better for you, or is it really site dependent and dependent and dependent on what kind of development you're seeking to deliver on? That, that's that, actually that is a really good question. So, whilst we think a, a certain structure that we've achieved is always the best thing to model, and you know the cookie cutter approach is always the easy option, what I have seen is its structure is very project. Um, specific yeah. and you, you really need to look at all the structures. I know structures were spoken about earlier and I think we've got a hybrid and, and all, probably examples of all those structures, um, whether that be ground leases, JVs, yeah. um, fund throughs, leases, um, long term leases or, or so. It, you really have to look at the, at the particular project to identify what the right structure is for that, that particular project. Um, and get the right partner for the project. So saying we had a, a, a preferred, you know, a, a, Colleagues here will say that we've um, partnered up with Charter Hall on numerous projects and they were our preferred, but Charter Hall wasn't the right partner on residential development, so we yeah. didn't partner up with them. So yeah. you, you, it's project specific. Yeah. You, no, you, I, think you know, that, I, I think that's right. Yeah. That, was a, that was a bit of a mean question. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I really like about um, the engineering hub at Parramatta, the innovation hub at Parramatta, is you've partnered with UNSW. So you've got you've ticked the absolute sweet spot for me in terms of going and working with another university to collaborate on a space to deliver better outcomes. Um, was that a big hurdle for the university to come over mentally, or was that sort of a bit of an easy sell because you could see the benefits? Um, no, it, it, for, for us it actually wasn't. Um, you know, uh, I think, and, and um, the vice president Peter. Pickering and, and um, Barney Glover, the Vice Chancellor, were always very open to collaboration. Um, they also had, had, had an understanding that we could not deliver teaching and learning to Western Sydney, the largest growing you know, area. You know, the population of a million plus people coming up. We, we look at the 18 to 24 year olds by 2026, there's 100,000 additional school leavers. It, just in that time frame, just in the Southwest, we, we, we could not um, provide tertiary education to those students, even if it was just to our market 
and bad word to use by a uh, catcher, uh, catcher. Um, um, but, but, and, and we had to let other universities in the, and work with other universities, but, but we always, the Vice Chancellor always said that we wanted other universities to give Western Sydney um, what it deserved, you know, a full blown comprehensive university and don't come in with a shop front and take the students back to, to the east or to the south and yeah. further. Um, and it was a no brainer for us. Um, we needed the other universities to come in to help. So we collaborated with UNSW on this one. It was hard work and I know um, um, Sancha and some of the other colleagues from UNSW are online. Um, you know, we got over that competitive sort of process and looked at how we could collaborate. The, on the academic side of the, of the business, it worked really well. Um, and using um, sharing resources and sharing facilities to create efficiency and meet that efficiency was, was why, why would we replicate like-for-like -like facilities yeah. and have only utilise them at 50% capacity when we could share them and utilise them at 95% capacity? Yes, against benchmark uh, standards from TEFMA, but, but we utilise those efficiencies. But it's not just unique to UNSW and us at BIH, you know, for Universities are coming together to establish the multiversity yeah. uh, at, at the Aerotropolis core, and it's you know, difficult, but collaboration is key there. But also with TAFE, um, we're talking to TAFE. University of Canberra have had an opportunity at um, Sydney Olympic Park. Uh, so there is multiple universities. University of Tasmania as recently as uh, the last few weeks. But we work with them to create collaboration in respect to ensuring the universities give the skill set, but also provide the tertiary requirements to, to the growing region of Western Sydney. We're very focused on Western Sydney yeah. and we're not um, we're not being shy of that fact. Um, and bringing that expertise to Western Sydney to help deliver that um, and, and have, you know, that tertiary attainment grow from that average of 17% to the, you know, 40 plus percent that's achieved in the East. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Now we are out of time. Yep. I, and I and I I'd like to pride myself on making sure we yeah. finish these things no, in time. Fine. But thank you so much for joining us and thank you to all of the speakers today who contributed. Um, but most importantly, thank you to everyone who dialed in. As I said, um, we haven't had time for q and I thought this might happen, but we're happy to take questions offline if that would be of help to all of you. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>